I just need a word from heaven that everything's okay. I try to walk by faith, but sometimes I'm so afraid and I cannot see how God can make a way. But then I I believe 
carry let me tell you about my jesus do you feel that empty feeling because shame's done all it's stealing and you're desperate for some healing let me tell you about my jesus oh disappear oh let me tell you about my jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who could work it out for your good let me tell you about my jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty. Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you. strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me let me tell you about my jesus and let It soothes 
Samuel chapter number 16. How many of you know what happened in chapter number 17? We find David and who? Let's say it again. David and who? Goliath. Everybody say Goliath. Okay, it's not a trick question. <laughs> in the Bible that I have, I'm going to give my son one day. Remember when the Holy Spirit taught me if you're ever going to have a chapter number 17, you first got to have a chapter number 16. See, chapter number 16 is where David not only had battles, but he was familiar with the battle. But David also knew how to be able to use that shepherd's staff, but the main thing, too, that really brought me to that is he played the harp. Listen to me. You're ever going to have a joyful life as a Christian, you're going to have to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord when nobody else is around. Sometimes I, I don't want to be Saul. Can I get an amen? Okay, maybe not. Anyway, sometimes I feel like the same way that David played that, I just feel like she could play that and just no matter what we faced or just something about sitting down and listening to the Holy Spirit. Can I get a witness right there? And does our heart good. You might not be like me. I'm busy. My fault. I'm glad when the Lord speaks to us. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 is where we're going to be. I'm going to read a few verses starting in chapter number 12, the last verse, actually. The last couple of weeks I've been back in this scripture. I've studied and been here before. And the Lord has really, I don't know, done something in my heart. I've been grateful specifically for our church, for the dynamic of our church, for the presence of God in our church. So this morning, I really, I come to this text as the Lord has used this text to help me to be thankful, but not only have I been thankful, but I also have been challenged at the same time. The Bible says in verse number 31 of chapter 12, notice if you will, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet, Watch us now, show I unto you a more excellent way. In other words, what God is saying is I'm getting ready to tell you something that's very important, probably most, one of the most profound things. Now we know the chapter 12, 13, and 14, when you study the Bible, there's a lot of things speaking about the spiritual gifts. We spend a lot of time talking about that in our church. When he dives into this, he says, there's something I need to tell you that's better than all of those things. You got saved, thank God you got the gift of salvation, but then also you got a spiritual gift. We have learned if we're ever going to be happy, if we're going to be content, we got to know what that spiritual gift is. But he dives into something almost to where it's like he takes a pause, if you will, and he says, but there's something I need you to know that's absolutely more important than anything else. So as he gets our attention there in verse number 31, he picks up in chapter 13, though 
I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and of all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods and feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Go down, if you will, to verse number 13. Notice what the Bible says here. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. I speak on this thought, how to have, how, how to have everything but still have nothing. How to have everything that you think that you need in your life, but still have nothing. Some people today are wondering why their life does not make an impact. Why their life cannot make a, a great influence on somebody. They, they do all the right things. They say all the right things. They sing in the right places. And they do everything that they're supposed to do. But at the end of the day, they wonder, why does my life not seem to be so influential on other people? Have you ever thought that maybe... We're good at doing everything that we're supposed to do, but there's something that's actually missing. And then we look at these people that sometimes, not being judgmental, they're not quite as talented, as gifted as we are. We wonder why and how in the world does God use somebody like them? I would dare say because they're missing or they have the very thing that we're missing. And he says what it is. It's very plain in chapter number 13. The greatest of these is love. Notice I get my thought from the two verses in, tw in 2 and 3. The Bible says in the latter part of both of them, he says, I could not remove mountains and have not charity. Watch this now, I am nothing. In verse number 3, he says, and be burned. He said, have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So in other words, you can have almost everything. You can have it all, but still have nothing. And I just say that for this reason. You can do everything that you're supposed to do, but if you do not do it led and motivated with a sincere love of God that's in your heart, it's all in vain. I want to ask you something very quickly, and I'll move on. What's the greatest thing that people knows about you? Is it your money? Is it your singing ability? Is it how strong-willed you are? They can depend on you for anything. Is it the way that you quote your Bible, you teach your Sunday school, the way you preach? Or I wonder if it's the way you love. I wonder if it's the way that you are sincere, you care about them. When they mess up, when they're right, when they're wrong, no matter how good you are and no matter how many times you do what you're supposed to do, is the greatest thing that they see within you and your life in the words, as we preached a couple of weeks ago, that there is power in the tongue, the power of death and life. It's in the tongue. I wonder when people look at you, do they see love? Do they feel love? Do they feel love even in their failure? Do they feel love even in their shortcomings? Do they feel love even when they stumble? Do they feel love when they're on the mountaintop and when they're in the valley? Do they feel a consistent love? Why, Brother Jason? Because the Bible says that God loved us with an unconditional love. And if we're going to have the love of God that's going to be in our heart, we're going to share that with others. Watch me now. There's a lot of Christians. I was just talking to a lady this morning and said that somebody in her family for 20 years has not darkened the door of a church. Why? Because of a bottle? Because of drugs? Because of, no, because of God's people. We do everything right. We cross our T's and dot our I's. For the most part, we got it all figured out. But we're so consumed with formalities and formats and structure. And listen, I'm not getting away from that. I'm not getting away from your structure. I'm not getting away from your standard. I'm all for it, friend. But not to have love, you have absolutely nothing. Now watch me now. Yes, there's hypocrites in the world. Yes, there's hypocrites at the bar. Yes, there's hypocrites at the ball field. Yes, there's hypocrites at the job site. They only see the ones at church. I understand that. So how do you change their mind? You love them with a genuine love. The only way to take away their excuse is to love them with a genuine 
love. No matter what, there's going to be hypocrites because as long as we live in the flesh, you can dress up the flesh, you can put makeup on the flesh, you can do whatever you want to do, but flesh is still flesh. And all God's people said? So he says here, the one thing that matters above all things is love. And I wonder, does anybody say that about you? I never forget a couple of years ago, I've shared this with the church. I was reading after D.L. Moody. Some of you know that he had pastored. There was a young man by the name of Henry Morehouse that he was a young preacher. The touch of God was on his life. During those days, we didn't have cell phones, didn't have anything like social media. So there was nothing to be able to contact. So there was a telegram, things that would be sent across. And he'd seen this young man and he had told him, he said, listen, if you're ever in the area of my church, I want you to be able to come and be able to preach for me. Not long after that, a telegram had came in. That young man, Morehouse, had actually sent in and said, hey, I just want you to know I'm going to be in the area. He turned around and wrote back to him and told him, unfortunately, I'm going to be in absence. I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be preaching out somewhere. However, I want you to still come and preach at our church. That's how much that he was impressed with the touch of God that was on this young man's life. So just like D.L. Moody had said, he had left out, of course, his church. His wife was still at the, at the local church. He went out to go preach. Of course, as he left, Morehouse was there, was preaching. He preached the first night, the second night, the third night, the fourth night, the fifth night, the sixth night. Sixth night, D.L. Moody comes back. When he walks back in, he gets the words that no preacher ever really wants to hear. But, of course, it's a joy. But, Brother Travis, we don't always want to hear it because he looks at his wife and he says to her, he says, well, how's things been in the revival? This is what she said. Oh, it's the best it's ever been. <laughs> in his mind, he's like, oh, I'm gone for one week and it's the best it's ever been. Literally, it wasn't just pride. It's just he's wondering what's so different about this meeting what did he preach on? Just like anybody would do, Brother Larry. What message did he preach? What subject did he preach? Wanted to be able to know. She said, it's weird. She said the first night that he came in, he preached on John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. What did he preach on Tuesday night? John 3, 16. What did he preach on Wednesday night? John 3.16, and Thursday and Friday, every single night, he preached on the love of God. He was so confused, but yet amazed. He goes in the next day, he sees this young man, this young man again, just like any other young man, young preacher, anticipating to be able to sit on the pew and listen to D.L. Moody preach the Word of God, Brother Travis. D.L. Moody walks up to him, and he talks to him, and he says, I want to tell you, thank you so much for preaching. But I just want to be able to ask you this morning, would you be willing to preach again for us today now that I am here? Would you do so? The young man said, well, of course I would. D.L. Moody took his seat. He came down and he sat on the front pew. And as he sat on the front pew, that young man mounted that pulpit. And once again with anticipation, after six days have passed by, he looks up wondering what in the world is this young man going to preach? He opens up and with tears flowing from his eyes, he says, open your Bible again to John 3, 16. That young man began to preach and people began to flood the altars. Things began to happen in that service as if he had never preached it before. And in the backdrop of where D.L. Moody was sitting, there was a banner just like we've got banners. It's up there. And as he was sitting there, the Holy Spirit was dealing with his heart. This young man preached on the love of God. And on the banner on the backside they had up in the church, it said, God is love. And he said at that moment, Brother Danny, it was like the Holy Spirit spoke to him that he knew right in that moment exactly what he had been missing he had preached the right things and he had said the right things he believed the right things all of these things was right D.L. Moody had truth there was no doubt about it but the one thing that he was missing in every single message that he preached was the love of God the tears the brokenness and D.L. Moody said from that day forward never again did I ever preach without a brokenness that God gave me that was filled with the love of God and it said it literally had changed his ministry and I wonder today how many times 
that we do what we do and we, we go through all the motions and we uh, cross every T and dot every I. We go through the Sunday school hour. We have church, but we do not do it with the love of God. We don't look out like the Bible says to Jesus in Matthew chapter number 9. said he looked out upon the multitude and he was moved with compassion. He seen them not as stupid sheep, not as, as bullheaded sheep. Those sheep are not smart animals, no. But he seen them, watch me now, not as their weakness. Not as their flaws, but he's seen them, as the Bible says, as sheep having no shepherd. I know why. Because he had love. I want to ask you again, what is it that you do? What title do you have? What platform has God given you? Not just as a church member, as a church leader, but as a mother, as a father, as a husband, as a wife. I ask you today, when you speak to your family, when you do things in your home, do the, do the kids know when you're beginning to set something up so you could just prove them wrong? Does your wife know or your husband know when you begin to do something because you're over there, and forgive me, I'm going to kind of probably lose the touch here in a moment, but nonetheless, you're over there, and she's in there folding the clothes up, and she's kind of huffing and puffing a little bit just so you realize you didn't fold your clothes? He said, that's petty, brother Jason. I know it is. But you get the point. Sometimes we know how to do things, and it ain't always motivated by the love of God. I'm going to say this. You and I can live our life the way we want to. We can run our house the way we want to. We can work our job. Whatever it is, I believe we ought to be yielded to the Holy Spirit no matter what we do. But I will say this. The one thing, the one thing, the one thing, and it needs to start with us personally. But the one thing that begins to open up my eyes is that we're seeing it now publicly because it's happening more in the churches than it's ever happened before because now we've learned how to passively, aggressively, and all God's people said, passively, aggressively put people in their place. And we've been so good we can do it with a smile on our face and say things like this, brother, I know you didn't mean that, but and we wonder why people are leaving. We wonder why, by the way, for all our young adults, I'm so proud of you. We wonder why last week so many of us rejoiced because we've seen a room full of young adults while we're praying so much for them to be able to stay, and they're not staying all the time. They're leaving. You want to know why? Because they've been around church long enough that they've seen our ways. They've heard our words. They know our mannerisms. And I also see the way we treat people. They Watch me now. Those who gossip to you will gossip about you. So what happens is they hear the way that you and I speak, and I was like, oh, Brother Travis, blah, blah, Brother Gay, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden what happens is then I move on, and I'm over here talking. Well, then Brother Travis remembers, well, I gossip to you, so I'm going to gossip about you. And they don't want to be around church no more. Or they know how to be able to do those little things, and they put them in the right place. Or some people, they might not say this, but sometimes, listen, they go to church out of obligation. Not because they want to be there. And, and they want to do it because they're more spiritual than somebody else. And I'm not expecting y'all to amen me right there. It's okay. I know a lot of people, we, we come to church because we love God. We want to honor God. And we, we, that's what the Bible commands. I believe that. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 25. I, I can quote the scripture to you, read the scripture. I agree with you. But there are still some people that come to church and do what they do just because they're trying to prove a point that they're better than somebody else. We wonder why our words, why our actions, why our services, why our gifts don't have the touch that they should. And I ask you again, is the greatest thing that people see about you your gift? Is it your ability? Is it how right you are? Or is it really the love of God? I'm going to give you a few things if I can because I believe the love of God is the very thing that fixes everything. I've seen the love of God, whether you want to admit this or not, I've seen it cut through hatred. I've seen it cut through bitterness. I've seen it cut through resentment. I, 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 I've, seen, I've seen forgiveness be given 
because of the love of God. I can remember at times where things would happen, but the love of God was soft in somebody's heart. I have chased people down to put my arms around them just to, just to share the love of God because you know in the moment you can't do anything. There's been moments that we have had in our life that we say that only God himself could do that. But if it was not for the love of God, listen, they would never change. I've seen rebelling teenagers, young adults, adults, grown adults, mature 50, 60 year old adults rebel on God, walk away, and then not come back because a preacher pointed in their face. They didn't come back because somebody in the family called them out. They didn't come back because somebody was able to be able to motivate them and enough of showing them what the Word of God said. No, that's not why they came back. They came back because they seen somebody that really had the love of God in their life. And I'm going to tell you something. Anything that we do that does not have the love of God, we ought to quit doing it. Because if we don't have it, what's going to happen is there's going to be a day it's going to be shown that we do it by the flesh and we don't do it by the Spirit and people's going to walk away and we're going to wonder what happened. Why? Because the love of God is the greatest thing. You can have everything that you think that you have and still have nothing if you do not have the love of God. I want to say this to you very quick. He said, Brother Jason, I'm saved. When I got saved, I love God. As the Bible says, I love him because he first loved me. Hallelujah. But that don't mean you've yielded to the Spirit. That don't mean that you talk that way. That don't mean you'll act that way. That don't mean that you're doing what you're supposed to do. So just because it's in you don't mean that you're allowing it not to be smothered. No, friend, you need to, you need to let the love of God be seen in what you do and how you speak and how you act. Let me give you a few things. Number one, the necessity of God's love. What do you mean by that, Brother Jason? Notice what the Bible says, if you will, in verse number one. He says again, he said, I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not charity. I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. He says in verse number two, he says, though I have to get the prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, I have all faith. He says that I could, watch this now, remove mountains and have not charity. I am nothing. There it is again. Verse number three says, though I bestow all my goods and feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Do you notice? He says over and over and over, nothing and nothing. In other words, you cannot substitute the love of God. It's something that's pure. It's genuine. It's sincere. You can have everything you want, but if you don't have the love of God, you have absolutely nothing. There's a necessity of it. It's needed. It is the one quote-unquote remedy that you and I must have and possess as an individual and as a church, but as a Christian, if we're ever going to do anything for the glory of God. Notice what he says. He says, you can be as loud as you want. Did you see what he said in verse number one? He says, you can speak all that you want to speak, but if it don't have the love of God, it's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. In other words, it's just like a lot of noise. You know what I hear a lot of times, not just from the pew, but also from the pulpit, there's a lot of noise. A lot of people saying something, but they ain't got the love of God with them. Somebody help me. And I just sit there, and you can say what you want, but this is what happens. To that one that's bitter, to that one that's cold, to that one that's lost, if they don't sense the love of God, you know what they do? They tune us out, and all it is is just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. How long can I sit here and just listen to this noise till I get out? Everybody all right? No matter what you do, you can say what you want. But if you don't say it in love, it's just a sound that's made. Not only that, but notice in verse number two, he says this. There's no substitute. In other words, he says, I have what? I, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand the mysteries, mysteries and the knowledge. He said, I have all this, the faith. I have all of these things. I can remove mountains. But watch me. But if I don't have the love of God, it's nothing. In other words, this, the, when you look at the necessity of the love of God, it's not just about it. It's the sound that's just being made, but it's also about the substitute. You can, you can justify any way you want to justify yourself. But no matter what you do, no matter how you do things, you cannot remove the love of God and think that it's sufficient. It's never going to be sufficient. If I can say it this way, the love of God is the thumbprint. It's the fingerprint of somebody who's born again and on their way to heaven. There's a lot of people that I know, listen, they go to church, they sit in the pew, they've probably seen the choir, and they've been baptized, they go to Sunday school, they can quote all the Bible, they put a suit and tie and a dress on, they do everything, okay? But they're going to die and go to hell because you can do what you do, but that don't make you a Christian. It's who you are that makes you a Christian. And we're so busy, don't get quiet when I say this now, we're so busy and so consumed with trying to pay, make people do things. Listen, we, we want them to be, no, when you know who you are, you will do what you're supposed to do. 
So when you're saved, you have the love of God in your heart. You're led by the love of God, not by the standard, not by uh, the religion. No. And by the way, they'll never contradict yourself. So I'm not, I'm not trying to preach a different gospel. I'm not trying to condone people having issues. No, no, no. If you have the love of God, that don't mean that you're going to condone sin. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible just says that you're going to come just like Jesus says. You're going to draw a line and say, those of you without sin, you can cast the first stone. You can, you can literally come to them and you can love them, have compassion on them, but still not condemn them. For the love of God does. Notice it goes further. Verse number three, he says what? He said, though I bestow all my goods and fed, feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I have, watch this now, not charity, it profited me nothing. So not only is it a sound, it's a substitute, but also there's no sacrifice. You can sacrifice all you want. You can give all you want to the church. You can give all your time to the church. You can give all your money to the church. You can give, 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 and give. But there is no sacrifice that will ever mean anything if you do not do it out of the love of God. What's it sound like? What's it look like, Brother Jason? I'm glad you asked. It's when we give that love offering to the family and then we think they misuse it. It's when you help that person that is standing on the corner, the Holy Ghost, you felt like just told you to do it, so you give them a little money. The next week you pull up and they're sitting there with a fifth of liquor in their hand. And you get mad. You know what it just revealed? You're so interested in sacrificing, but it ain't led by the love of God because the love of God ain't for your glory. The love of God is to share the love of God. That's the motivation. And when you pull back up, you don't judge them. You don't get mad at how they do it because here's why. You and I will give an account before God on how we are obedient to God on what we sacrifice. They will give an account for how they take the blessings that's given to them. Somebody help me right there, okay? But we're so busy trying to control everybody that we push them away. And this is what we do. Well, I gave you $5 last week. I see what you got in your hand. Oh, I guess we won then, didn't we? According to my Bible, John chapter number 4, and I'm meddling now, John chapter number 4, he knew that she had a lot of husbands. But he sat down with her. He, he didn't call her out immediately. He built a relationship with her. He talked to her. He connected to her. And then after he connected with her, watch me now, then she, at that moment, she admitted she needed something. And what did he do? He brought her to the place where she could admit her faults, her failures, her sin. And because of that connection, it was the love of God that drawn her, and it was the love of God that kept her. And what did she do? When she went back, she went back, she said, come see a man that told me everything that I know, everything that I've ever did, and yet he loved me anyway. Somebody say amen. You got to have a pure heart. I want to ask you again. Just don't look at the drunkard or the homeless on the street. It's so easy to be able to do that. Because the truth be told, you might not like what I'm about to say. If you'll treat somebody like that, that way, you're probably treating your family that way. Because habits are habits, friends. Character is character. And if you're, if you're not led by the Spirit there, then you're not going to be led by the Spirit there. You better understand that the necessity of the love of God is the number one thing that matters above all things. The second thing I want you to see is not only the necessity of the love of God, but also I want you to see the sufficiency of God's love. In other words, what can, what can the, the love of God actually do for us? Notice what the Bible says. Follow along with me. There's a lot that's here. It's able to be able to guide us. It molds us. That's how good it is. It, it does things that we can never imagine. Notice, if you will, in verse number four, watch with me. Charity, what? There it is. That's the love of God. It what? Suffereth long. You know what that means? It's patient. Are you patient? Are you patient with people? Do you love people? Are you patient with people that you minister to? Are you, are you loving them through everything? Because the Bible says that, 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 that the love of God, it suffereth long. That means that, means, that, that means that you'll go a long ways with them. No matter how far it goes, that you will suffer long. You will be long-suffering with them. That's what the love of God does. The love of God don't have no timeline. Amen, Brother Jason. That's good preaching. Thank God it don't because I'd have messed up a long time ago and he'd have gave up on me. But then we get up here, he never gave up, mercy reached out. How, how can we do that but yet act a different way? 
Not only does it suffer long, notice what the Bible says, it says, and it's kind. You know what I've learned? There's a lot of people, they say what's right, but they don't say it with, with love and sweetness. Amen. And then we say things like that. Well, it's just who I am. You didn't get saved to say, stay who you are. You're to be more in the image of Christ. So therefore, there ought to be a transformation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Things ought to be different today than it was 10 years ago when you got born again. There ought to be something that's kind in you. Maybe you still do have a little bit of temper. Maybe you do bite off a little bit. You say a little bit more than what you should. But you should be a little more kind than what you used to be. I'll be honest, the other week when I was reading through this and going back through this, again, I said to you, I was so thankful for our church. I really believe, and I'm not just saying this, I really believe that I feel the love of God in this place all the time. I really do. I, I, I really believe, that I, I know we can be better, but I am so, th that, that is the one thing that I am the most thankful for in this church outside the presence of the Lord is feeling the love of God. And I don't know how you can have the presence of the Lord and not have the love of God in the same place. Amen? So you sense it. So you're kind. So not only does it suffer long, but you're also kind. But watch this now. It envieth not. That means, in other words, you don't get mad at people when things happen. No, 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 no. You rejoice with them. Okay? When they get blessed and, they, and, and they're living a prosperous life and they get favor on them, you, you don't get to where you get mad or get jealous of it. No, the, the love of God don't do that. Well, look at them driving a new car. May, wait a minute, wait a minute. The dignified Christian says something like this. Hmm. See, so you got a new car. <laughs> we know what you're saying. Amen. Everybody all right? No, praise the Lord. You got some new wheels. Amen. Hallelujah. The love of God wants to see people blessed. A couple weeks ago, I was preaching on a Wednesday night talking about Joseph. The Bible says that Pharaoh came and he wanted to be able to bless Joseph's family. Most people would be mad because why? If they were ever treated the way Joseph was, the way his family treated him, they'd be mad and say, why are you going to bless them after all the things they put me through? But the Bible never says that Joseph got mad. Never got mad. You want to know why? Because he had the love of God in his heart. The Bible says, notice after that, not only that, but it's also vaulteth not. And it says that it's not puffed up. The Bible says in verse number five, notice what he says. It says, it doth not behave itself unseemingly. So that means, in other words, it's not rude. It's not rough. Some of us are so rough. And again, we say the same thing. Well, that's just who I am. Again, friend, God didn't save you for you to stay who you are. That'll be something different about you. You shouldn't be so rough around the edges. That don't mean you got to compromise. And that don't mean that you got to, you know, be weak just because you're submitted to the Lord. Some people might think you're weak. But friend, when you're submitted to the Lord, that don't make you weak. Amen. So he says that you're not somebody that behaves unseemly. Notice this. He says, then it's, and it says what? And he seeketh not her own. The love of God seeketh not her own. In other words, it don't always, look up here, it don't always have to be your way. You see why he's talking to believers? I mean, there's a lot. Of, I, know, I know I'm teaching, preaching this morning. Man, I love the Bible. You love the Bible? Say amen. I mean, I, I love the Bible. When I look in that and I see that, I, I don't just thank God for the church and thank God for you, but I'm, I'm convicted. So I'm like, Lord, I want to make sure that everything that I do, it don't have to be my way. I'm, I might be the pastor and friend. Listen, I'll say it from my pulpit. I would never say this in anybody else's pulpit. There's a lot of preachers. They, they want you to toot their horn before they toot, you toot, toot God's horn. They want you to be able to follow him instead of following God, uh, following God himself. And I'm just being honest with you, okay? And, and here's what it is. Well, this is what I said. I'm the man of God in this church, and this is the way it's going to be. Well, let me just say this, friend. That don't always make you right because, again, like I said, you can say the right thing the wrong way and not share the love of God. We get to this place where it's like all of a sudden it's got to be my way, and if you don't like it, then you can go somewhere else. Shame on somebody that ever says that. Why, why can't, why, unless it's Scripture, why can, uh, why can we not agree to disagree? Why, why can we not just be okay unless it's Bible and it's doctrine and it has anything to do with the Lord? Listen, just because you don't like green carpet don't mean you should leave the church. Amen. Just because you don't like something that's a song that's your style don't mean you like the church when it's still biblically sound. Everybody all right? I, I lost about 50% of you right there. 
I'm all, I'm, my, there's some things in me I don't prefer. I'm different. But if I look out and I see people ministering and, man, I see people getting blessed and getting help, flooding the altar. Listen, again, I go back to the love of God. I'm not mad and bitter. I'm rejoicing that they're getting blessed. That's the love of God that's in my heart. Oh, so he says, do not seek their own. He says the same verse, verse number five, not provoked. Notice that, not easily provoked. That means, in other words, you don't have a temper. Mm. Amen. In other words, in other words, you're yielded. You know, the love of God soft in your heart. You're, listen, you think before you speak. You are led by the Spirit and not by emotion. So therefore, the temper ain't as easy as it used to be. Somebody say amen. Oh, have mercy what God can do with somebody like that. I'm telling you, friend, I, I mean, in my mind, there's some things, I mean, it just will blow your mind. If my Aunt Billy ever got a microphone and she stood up and started telling you who I was before I got saved, you would think she done ate one too many Happy Meals. And to God be the glory. I'm telling you, I could tell when my aunt looks at me, and I, I mean, y'all going to think I'm crazy. She's praying. Jay, don't break. Don't break. I know it. But the Bible says that when you have the love of God, you're different. Notice it, keep going. The Bible says this, think no evil. You know what that means? We don't keep record of everybody's wrongdoings. You know what I've learned is a lot of us, we know more about what people done messing up than what they have done for the glory of God. The love of God don't keep that account. Somebody help me right there. Well, I remember in this year and that year and this year, and I remember that. There. Listen, you can, you can do all you want to. You can talk about it. You can put it in your notes on your computer. You can write it down. You can do whatever you want. But if all you can do is go back and talk about yesterday, it's just showing the love of God is not really controlling you as much as you say it is. Amen. Verse number seven. Bears all things. That means it carries stuff. How many of you are glad you got people in your life to help you carry some things? Being a Christian ain't always easy. Sometimes you got to carry. You say, how do you do that? It's the love of God. Notice what he says. He says, verse number seven, same thing. He says, beareth all things, believeth all things. That means I, 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 I believe the best in God and the best in God's people. Just, if that's what God says, hallelujah, that's what God's going to do. And by the way, when you look at people, you believe all things. Yes, they just got born again, Brother Travis, but hallelujah, if God did it for me and you, God can do it for them. Or we say things like this, it's just an emotional thing. They say they got saved, they've already missed one Sunday night. You know, we've seen this before. There they go posting again on Facebook. Thank God you didn't have Facebook when you got saved. Whoa! Whoa! Amen. But we're tallying it up, ain't we? You say, how do you know when they do that? Because they're the first ones to speak when everything begins to hit the rubber to the road. We don't need none of that spirit around here. And thank God, because ain't not one of us perfect. Everybody all right? Hopes all things. Let me give you a third thing. Not only the sufficiency of God's love, necessity of God's love, but number three, write down the eternality of God's love. Verse number eight, notice this if you will. The Bible says, charity never faileth. Do you realize? Let's go down to the last part of that. Look, look at verse number 13. And now abideth. Watch these three things. Faith. Everybody say faith. Everybody say hope. Everybody say charity. Watch this now. Do you realize when we get to heaven, faith will no longer exist. It'll be sight. Hope will no longer exist. It'll be reality. Everybody all right? With the love of God, it'll be as much on this side as it is on that side. And it's almost like God is saying to us, you get a little bit of heaven while you're here on earth because of the love of God. Let me give you a last thing, and I'm done. If somebody comes to the piano, number four, write it down. The duty of the love of God. Notice in verse number 14 what the Bible says. Chapter 14, verse number 1, I'm sorry. Follow after charity. Follow after charity. 
That's your duty. Your duty before you do everything that you're supposed to do is to be moved by the Spirit of God inside of you for the love of God and the love that God has put in your heart for people. Before you speak, you follow after charity. Before you rebuke, you follow after charity. Before you sing, before you teach, before you preach, you follow after charity. Before you lead those kids, you follow after charity. You say, how do you know you messed up when they slam the door in your face when they're 18 years old? And it's something that happened that you wish you could take it back, but you can't take it back. You say, well, how do you get them back? Watch this now. How do you get them back? Even, because by the way, the Bible says train up a child in the way it should go when he's older, you will not depart from it. That don't mean that if you do what's right with the Bible, that they're never going to get outside of God's will. That just means that the word of God will never return void. So they might be out in the world, but what's going to happen is the word of God's going to be like a hook. Somebody say amen, and I'll bring them back in. So watch this now. What do you do? Just keep sharing the love of God. What happens when people in your family turn their back on you? Keep sharing the love of God. What happens when people walk out of your life on the job site? You gave them a chance and nobody else would. You follow after the love of God. What happens when people leave the church? As long as I'm the pastor, you're going to follow after the love of God. Because, see, you know what I've learned? The love of God extinguishes excuses. Amen. Amen. And the one thing about it, people say whatever they want to say, and let's just be frank for a minute, she begins to play. They're probably right when they talk about us to some degree, Right? But the one thing that I want them to know is this. Even though we mess up, we make mistakes. But one thing about brother so-and-so, one thing about Mr. So Miss so-and-so, they really did love us. Yeah, they could throw darts at you. And friend, as long as you look for mud and you look for wrong, you're going to find it. Everybody all right? Y'all awake? Amen. But I wondered this morning how many of us sometimes... Instead of looking for the good, being led by the love, we look for the negative. I want to ask you right now, are you singing that? What are you singing? That the words of my life, you know what I'm talking about? The, the words of my life. Can you do that one? Yeah, do that one. Yeah, I would sing it. The love of God just went out of this place. <laughs> Listen to me, and I'm done. I'm done. I know we're not a perfect church, and we're not perfect people. I know there's been a lot of things that you and I both have experienced, not just in the years that I've been here, but in all the years of your life. But I'll be honest with you, Kevin. You can come up to me and tell me some things that some people can't tell me. You want to know why? Because I know, even at my lowest, you still love me. And how many people you go around this room, and they don't love you because you're a pastor. They don't love you because you're a church member. They don't love you because, no, we get to go to the church together, but I love you because of the love of God that's in my heart. And that's what we need in this church. Everybody might not be like you, might not act like you. They might not do the same things that you do. Watch me now. And every kid might not be like your kids. Some of y'all will say, thank God. <laughs> Amen. But we just love each other. All right? Look up here. I know me. The Holy Spirit convicts me of me. 
I don't need nobody else to call me out all the time. Try to tell my wife that. Y'all pray that she gets the love of God in her heart. Hmm. Imagine this morning how different our marriage would be. How different our family would be. How different our church would be. Imagine how different this world would be. We just had the love of God. Heavenly Father, use your... It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart, and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God, and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the Word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you and this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved, and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way, and there's something heavy on your heart, again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.